Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us today for the virtual Vertica BDC 2020. Today's breakout session is entitled Vertica in Eon Mode, Past, Present, and Future. I'm Paige Roberts, Open Source Relations Manager at Vertica, and I'll be your host for this session. Joining me is Vertica Engineer Jan Zipe and Vertica Product Manager David Sprogis. Before we begin, I encourage you to submit questions or comments during the virtual session. You don't have to wait to the end. Just type your question or comment as you think of it in the question box below the slides and click Submit. Q&A uh, session at the end of the presentation will answer as many of your questions as we're able to during that time. And any questions that we don't address, we'll do our best to answer offline. If you wish, after the presentation, you can visit the Vertica forums to post your questions there, and our engineering team is planning to join the forums to keep the conversation going, um, just like a dev lounge at a normal uh, in-person BDC. So as a reminder, you can maximize your screen by clicking the double arrow button in the lower right corner of the slides if you want to see them bigger. And yes, before you ask, this virtual session is being recorded and will be available to view on demand this week. We'll, see, we'll send you a notification as soon as it's ready. All right, let's get started. Over to you, Dave. Thanks, Paige. Hey, everybody. Uh, let's start with a timeline of the life of Eon Mode. Uh, about two years ago, a little bit less than two years ago, we introduced Eon Mode on AWS uh, pretty specifically for the purpose of rapid scaling to meet the cloud economics promise. It wasn't long after that we realized that workload isolation, a byproduct of the architect, uh, architecture, was very important to our users. And uh, going to the third tick, you can see that uh, the importance of that workload isolation was manifest in Eon mode being made available on premise using pure storage FlashBlade. Uh, moving to the fourth tick mark, uh, we took steps to improve workload isolation with a new type of subcluster, which Yancy will go through. And to the fifth tick mark, uh, the introduction of secondary subclusters uh, for faster scaling and other improvements, which we will cover in the slides to come. Getting started with why we created Eon Mode in the first place, Let's imagine that your database is this pie. It's a pecan pie, and we're loading pecan data in through the ETL cutting board in the upper left-hand corner. We have a couple of free-floating pecans, which we might imagine to be uh, data supporting external tables. As you know, the Vertica has a uh, query, uh, query engine capability as well, which we call external tables. And so if we imagine this pie, we want to serve it with a number of servers. Well, let's say we wanted to serve it with three servers, three nodes. We would need to slice that pie into three segments. And we would serve each one of those segments from one of our nodes. Now, because the data is important to us and we don't want to lose it, we're going to be saving that data on some kind of RAID storage or redundant storage. In case one of the drives goes bad, the data remains available because of the durability of, of RAID. Imagine also that we care about the availability of the overall database. Imagine the, a node goes down, perhaps the second node goes down. Uh, we still want to be able to query our data. And through nodes one and three, we still have all three shards covered. And we can do this because of body projections. Each neighbor, each node's neighbor, contains a copy of the data from uh, the node next to it. And so in this case, node 1 uh, is sharing its segment with node 2. So node 2 can cover node 1, node 3 node uh, can cover node 2, and node 1 back to node 3. Adding a little bit more complexity, uh, we might store the data in different um, in, in different copies, each copy sorted for a different kind of query. We call this projections in Vertica. And uh, for each projection, we have another copy of the data sorted differently. 
Now it gets uh, complex. What happens when we want to add a node? Well, um, if we wanted to add a fourth node here, what we would have to do is figure out how to re-slice all of the data in all of the copies that we have. In effect, what we want to do is take our three slices and slice it into four, which means taking a portion of each of our existing thirds and resegmenting into quarters. Now that looks simple in the graphic here, but when it comes to moving data around, it becomes quite complex because for each copy of each segment, we need to re-slice it and move that data onto the new node. What's more, the fourth node can't have a copy of itself. That would be problematic in case it went down. Instead, what we need is we need that buddy to be sitting on another node, a neighboring node. So we need to uh, reorient the buddies as well. All of this takes a lot of time. It can take 12, 24, or even 36 hours in, in, a, in a period when you do not want your database under high demand. In fact, uh, you may want to stop loading data altogether in order to uh, speed it up. This is a planned event, and your applications should probably be down during this period, um, which, which makes it difficult. With the advent of cloud computing, uh, we saw that, uh, uh, that services uh, were coming up and down faster, and, and, and we determined to re-architect Vertica in a way to accommodate that rapid scaling. Let's see how we did it. So let's start with four nodes now, and we've got our four node uh, uh, database. Um, let's add communal storage and move each of the segments of data into communal storage. Now that, that's the separation that we're talking about. What happens if we run queries against it? Well, it turns out that the communal storage is not necessarily performant. And so the I.O. would be slow, which would make the overall queries slow. In order to compensate for the, uh, uh, the low performance of communal storage, we need to add back local storage. Now, it doesn't have to be RAID because this is just an ephemeral copy, but with the, uh, with the data files um, uh, local to the node, the queries will run much faster. In AWS, communal storage really does mean an S3 bucket. And uh, here's a simplified version of the diagram. Now, do we need to store all of the data from the segment in the depot? The answer is no, and the graphic inside the bucket has changed to reflect that. It looks more like a bullseye, showing just a segment of the data being copied to the cache or to the depot, as we call it, on each one of the nodes. How much data do you store on the node? Well, it would be the active data set the last 30 days, the last 30 minutes, or the last uh, um, whatever period of time you're working with. Um, the, working, the active working set is the hot data, and that's how large you want to size your depot. By architecting this way, when you scale up, you're not resegmenting the database. What you're doing is you're adding more compute and more subscriptions to the existing shards of the existing database. So in this case, we've added a complete set of four nodes. So we've doubled our capacity, and we've doubled our subscriptions, which means that now two shards, two nodes can serve the yellow shard, two, two nodes can serve the red uh, shard, and so on. In this way, we're able to run twice as many queries in the same amount of time. So you're doubling the concurrency. How, hard, how high can you scale? Well, can you scale to 3x, 5x? Um, we tested this in the graphic on the right, which shows concurrent users in the x-axis by the number of queries executed in a minute along the y-axis We've grouped execution in runs of 10 users, 30 users, 50, 70, up to 150 users. 
Now, focusing on any one of these groups, particularly up around 150, you can see through the three bars, starting with the uh, bright purple bar, three nodes and three segments, that as you add nodes to the middle purple bar, six nodes and three segments, you've almost doubled your throughput up to the uh, dark purple bar, which is nine nodes and three segments. And our tests show that you can go to 5x with pretty linear performance increase. Beyond that, you do continue to get an increase in performance, but your incremental performance begins to fall off. Eon Architecture does something else for us, and that is it provides high availability uh, because each of the nodes can be thought of as ephemeral. And in fact, each node has uh, a buddy subscription in a way similar to the prior architecture. So if we lose node four, we're losing the node responsible for the red shard, and now node one has to pick up responsibility for the red shard while that node is down. When a query comes in, and, it, and uh, let's say it comes into one and one is the initiator, then one will look for participants. It'll find a blue shard and a green shard, but when it's looking for the red, it finds itself. And so the node number one will be doing double duty. This means that your performance will be cut in half, approximately, uh, for the query. This is uh, uh, acceptable um, until you're able to restore the node. Once you restore it and once the depot becomes rehydrated, then your performance goes back to normal. So this is a, a, a much simpler way to recover nodes in the event of node failure. By comparison, enterprise mode, the, the older architecture, when we lose the fourth node, node one takes over responsibility for the first shard and the, 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 the yellow shard and the red shard, but it also is responsible for rehydrating the entire uh, data segment of the red shard to node four. This can be very time consuming and Im imposes uh, even more stress on the first node, so performance will go down even further. Eon mode has another feature, and that is you can scale down completely to zero. We call this hibernation. You shut down your database, and your database will maintain full consistency in a rest state in your S3 bucket. And then when you need access to your database again, you simply uh, recreate your cluster and uh, uh, revive your database, and you can access your database once again. That concludes the rapid scaling portion of why we created Eon Mode. To take us through workload isolation is Yancy Bay. Yancy? Thanks, Dave, for presenting how Eon works in general. In the next section, I will show you another important capability of vertical EL mode, the workload isolation. Dave used uh, a pecan pie as an example of database. Now let's say it's time for the main course. Does anyone still have a problem with food touching on their plate? Parents know that it's a common problem for kids. Well, we have the similar problem in database as well. So there could be multiple different workloads accessing your database at the same time. Say you have ETL jobs running regularly. Well, at the same time, there are um, dashboards running short queries against your data. You may also have the end of month report running, and there can be ad hoc data scientists connect to the database and do whatever the data analysis they want to do, and so on. How to make these mixed workload requests not interfere in each other is a real challenge for many DBAs. Vertical EL mode provides you the solution. I'm very excited here to, to introduce you the important concept uh, in EL mode called subclusters. In EL mode, nodes are to belong to the predefined subclusters rather than the whole cluster. 
EBA can define different subcluster for different kinds of workloads and redirects those workloads to the specific subclusters. For example, you can have an ETL subcluster, dashboard subcluster, report subcluster, and uh, analytic machine learning subcluster. Vertical ER subcluster is designed to achieve the three main goals. First of all, strong workload isolation. That means any operation in one subcluster should not affect or be affected by other subclusters. For example, say the subcluster running the report is quite overloaded, and for example, um, and or there can be data science running crazy analytic jobs, uh, machine learning jobs on the analytic subcluster and make it very slow, even stuck or crash or whatever. In such scenario, your ETL and dashboard subcluster should not be, or at least very minimum, be impacted by this crisis. And which means you, your ETL job should not be lagged behind and the dashboard should respond timely. We have done a lot of improvements as of 10.0 release and will continue to deliver the improvements in this category. Secondly, fully customized uh, subcluster settings. That means any subcluster can set up and tune for very different workloads without affecting other subclusters. Users should be able to tune up, tune down certain parameters based on the actual need of the individual cluster uh, subcluster workload requirement. As of today, Vertica already supports few settings that can be done at the subcluster level, for example, the depot painting policy. And then we will continue extending more settings like the resource pools, knobs, in the near future. Lastly, Vertical subcluster should be easy to operate and cost efficient. This, what this means is that the subcluster uh, should be able to turn on, turn off, uh, add or remove, or should be avail uh, available for use according to rapid changing workloads. Let's say in this case you want to spin up more dashboard subcluster because you need higher query throughput. You can do that. And you, uh, if you need to, you might need to run several report subcluster because you want, you might want to run multiple reports at the same time. While on the other hand, you can shut down your analytic machine learning subcluster because no data scientists uh, need to use it at this moment. So we made also made a lot of change improvements in this category, which I'll explain in detail later. And one of the ultimate goal. Uh, is to support auto scaling. To sum up, what we really want to deliver for subcluster is very simple. You just need to remember that accessing subcluster should be just like accessing individual clusters. Well, these subclusters do share the same catalog, so users don't have to work on the stale data and don't need to worry about data synchronization. That being a nice goal, Vertical upcoming 10.0 release is certainly a milestone towards that goal, uh, which will deliver a large part of the capability in this direction, and we will continue to improve it after 10.0 release. Um, in the next couple of slides, I will highlight some issues uh, about workload isolation in the initial Eon release and show you how we so, uh, resolve these issues. First issue, uh, when we initially released our first or so-called subcluster mode, it was implemented using fault groups. Well, fault groups and the subcluster have something in common. Yes, they are both uh, defined as a set of nodes. However, they are very different from uh, in, the, in all the other ways. So what, that was very confusing in the first place when we implemented this. As of 9.3.0 version, we decided to detach subcluster definition from the fault groups, which enabled us to further extend the capability of subclusters. Fault groups in the pre-9.3 versions will be converted into subclusters during the upgrade. And this was a very important step that enabled us all the, to give, uh, provide all the amazing following improvements on subclusters. The second issue 
in the past was that it's hard to control the execution groups for different type of workload. There are two type of problems here, and I will use some examples to explain. The first issue is about control group size. Say you allocate six nodes for your dashboard subcluster, and what you really want is the, on the left three pairs of nodes as three execution groups, and each pair of nodes uh, will need to subscribe to all the four shards. However, that's not really what you get. What you really get is the, on the right side that the first four nodes subscribe to one shard each, and the rest two nodes subscribe to two dangling shards. So you won't really get three execution groups, but instead only get one, and the two extra nodes have no value at all. The solution is to use subclusters. So instead of having a subcluster with six nodes, you can split it up into three smaller ones. Each subcluster will guarantee to subscribe to all the shards, and you can further um, handle these three subclusters using a uh, load balancer across them. In this way, you achieve the three real execution groups. The second issue is that the session participation is not non-deterministic. Any session will just pick four random nodes from the subcluster as long as it covers one shard each. In other words, you don't really know which set of nodes will make up your execution group. What's the problem? So in this case, the fourth, the fourth node will be double booked by two concurrent sessions. And uh, you can imagine that uh, the resource usage will be unbalanced and both queries uh, performance will suffer. What is even worse is that uh, if queries uh, of the two concurrent sessions target different table, it will cause the issue that depot efficiency uh, will be reduced because both sessions will try to fetch the files uh, onto two tables into the same depot. And if your depot is not enough, uh, large enough, they will evict each other, which will be very bad. To solve this uh, the same way, uh, you can solve this uh, by uh, declaring subclusters. Uh, in this case, two subclusters and the uh, load balancer group across them. Um, the reason uh, it solved the problem is because the session participation would not go across subcluster boundary. So there won't be a case that any node is double booked. And in terms of the depot, and if you uh, if, if you use the subcluster and the, avoid using a uh, load balancer group and carefully send the first uh, workload to the first subcluster and the second to the second subcluster, and then the result of uh, is, is that the depot isolation is achieved. The first subcluster will maintain the, da uh, the data files for the first query and uh, don't need to worry about um, the file being evicted by the second kind of session. Here comes the next issue, uh, is the scaling down. In, in the old way of defining subclusters, you may have uh, several execution groups in the subcluster. You, you want to shut it down one or two execution groups to save cost. Well, here comes the pain, because you don't know which nodes may be used by which session at any point. It is hard to find the right timing to hit the shutdown button of any of those instances. And if you do and get unlucky, Say in this case, you pull the first uh, four nodes. One of the session will fail because it's participated in the node two and node four at that point. User of that session will notice because their query fails. And we know that for many business, this is critical problem and not acceptable. Again, with subclusters, this problem is resolved. Same reason, uh, session cannot go across the subcluster boundary. So all you need to do is just first prevent the query uh, sent to the, the, sub, the first subcluster, and then you can shut down the instances in that subcluster. You are guaranteed to not break any running sessions. Now you are happy and you want to shut down more subclusters. Then you hit a, a, uh, the issue four. The, the whole cluster will go down. Why? Because the cluster loses quorum. As a distributed system, you need to have 
um, at least more than half of the nodes to be up in order to commit and keep the cluster up. This is to prevent the catalog diversion from happening, which is important. But you still want to shut down those nodes because what, what's the point of keeping those nodes up and you, if you are not using them and, and let them cost you money, right? So Vertica has a solution. You can define a subcluster as secondary to allow them to shut down without worrying about quorum. In this case, you can define the first three subcluster as secondary and the fourth one as primary. By doing so, these secondary subclusters will not be count towards the quorum um, because we change the rule. Now, instead of requiring more than half of the node to be up, it only requires more than half of the primary node to be up. Um, now, you can shut down your second subcluster and even shut down your third subcluster as well and keep the remaining primary subcluster to be still running healthily. There are actually more benefits by defining secondary subcluster in addition to the quorum concern. Because the secondary subcluster no longer have the voting power, they don't need to persist catalog anymore. This means those nodes are faster to deploy and can be dropped and re-added. Um, uh, without the need to worry about the catalog persistency. For the most of the subcluster that only need to read only query, it's the best practice to define them as secondary. The, the commit will be faster on the secondary subcluster as well, so running this query on the secondary subcluster will have less spikes. Primary subcluster, as usual, handle everything, is responsible for consistency, so background tasks will be running, so uh, DBA should make sure that the primary subcluster uh, be stable and the Zoom is running all the time. Of course, you need at least one sub, uh, primary subcluster in your database. Now, with the secondary subcluster, user can start and stop um, as they need, uh, which is very convenient. And this further brings up another issue. Uh, is that if there is the ETL transactions running uh, and in the middle, a subcluster started and it become up. In older versions, there is no catalog resync mechanism to keep the new subcluster up to date. So Vertica rolls back the ETL session to keep the data consistency. This actually quite disruptive because uh, real world ETL workload can sometimes take hours. And rolling back at the end means a large waste of resources. We resolved this issue in 9.3.1 version by introducing a catalog resync mechanism when such situation happens. ETL transaction will not roll back anymore, but instead would take some time to resync the catalog and, and commit. And the problem is resolved. And last issue I would like to talk about is the subscription. Um, especially for large subcluster, when you start it, um, the startup time is quite long because the subscription commit used to be uh, serialized. Uh, in one of the in our internal testing with large catalog, committing a subscription, you can imagine uh, it takes uh, five minutes. Um, secondary subcluster is better uh, because it, it doesn't need to persist the catalog during the commit, but still take about two seconds to commit. So what's the problem here? Let's do the math and look at this chart. The x-axis is the time in the minutes, uh, and the y-axis is the number of nodes to be subscribed. The dark blues represent the primary subcluster, and light blue represents the secondary subcluster. Let's say the subcluster has 16 nodes in total, and if you start the secondary subcluster, it will spend about 30 seconds in total, because uh, 2 seconds times 16 is 32. Um, it's, it's, done, it's not uh, actually uh, that long time, but if you imagine that starting secondary subcluster, you, you expect it to be super fast to react to the fast changing workload. And 30 seconds is no longer trivial anymore. And what is even worse is on the primary subplus side, because the commit is much longer, and five minutes, let's assume, then at the point uh, you, you are committing the six nodes um, subscription, all other nodes, all other nodes already waited for 30 minutes for GCLX, or what we know, the global catalog lock. And the vertical will crash the node if uh, any node cannot get the GCLX for uh, 30 minutes. 
So the end result is that your whole database crashed. That's a serious problem, and we know that, and that's why we are we already planned for the fix for the 10.0, uh, so that all the subscription will be patched up, uh, batched up, and all the nodes will commit at the same time uh, um, concurrently. And by doing that, um, you can imagine uh, the primary subcluster can finish committing in five minutes instead of a crashing, and the secondary subcluster can finish even in seconds. That summarizes the highlights for the improvements we have done as of 10.0, and I hope you already get excited about the emerging Eon deployment pattern as shown here. A primary subcluster that handles data loading ETL jobs and tuple mover jobs is the backbone of the database, and you keep it running all the time. At the same time, defining different secondary subcluster for different workloads uh, and provision them when the workload requirement arrives and then deprovision them when the workload is uh, is done to save the operational cost. So can't wait to play the, with the cluster cluster. Here are some admin tools commands that you can start using. Uh, and uh, for more details, check out uh, our Eon subcluster documentation for more details. And thanks everyone for listening, and I'll head back to Dave to talk about the Eon Prem. Thanks, Yancy. At the same time that Yancy and the rest of the dev team were working on the improvements that Yancy described and, and other improvements, this guy, John Yovanovich, stood on stage and told us about uh, his deployment at AT&T where he was running Eon Mode on-prem. Now, this was only six months after we had launched Eon Mode on AWS, so when he told us that he was putting it into production on-prem, we nearly fell out of our chairs. How is this possible? We took a, a look back at, uh, at Eon and determined that the, the, the workload isolation and the improvement to the uh, um, operations for um, uh, restoring nodes and, and, and other things had sufficient value that John wanted to run it on-prem. And he was running it on the pure storage flash blade. Taking a second look at the flash blade, we thought, all right, well, uh, does it have the performance? Uh, yes, it does. Um, the flash blade is a collection of, of individual blades, each one of them with NVMe uh, storage on it, which um, uh, is not only uh, performant, um, but it's, um, uh, it's scalable. And so we then asked, uh, is, it, is it durable? Uh, the answer is yes. The data safety uh, is implemented with the N plus 2 redundancy, which, which means that up to two blades can fail and the data it remains available. And so with this, we realize DBAs can sleep well at night uh, knowing that their data is, uh, is safe. After all, Eon mode outsources the durability to the communal storage data store. Does FlashBlade have the capacity for growth? Well, yes, it does. You can start as low as 120 terabytes and grow as high as about 8 petabytes. So it certainly covers the range for most enterprise usages. And operationally, it couldn't be easier to use. When you want to grow your database, uh, you can uh, simply uh, pop new, flash, new blades into the FlashBlade unit, and you can do that hot. Uh, if one goes bad, you can pull it out and, and replace it hot. So you don't have to take your uh, data store down, and therefore you don't have to take Vertica down. Uh, knowing all of these things, we got behind Pure Storage and uh, partnered with them to implement uh, the, the, the first version of Eon on-premise. That changed our roadmap a little bit. We were imagining it would start with Amazon and then go to Google and then to Azure and, and at some point to Alibaba Cloud. But as you can see from the left column, we started with Amazon and went to Pure Storage. Uh, and then from Pure Storage, we went to uh, Minio. And we launched uh, Eon Mode on Minio in, um, uh, at the end of last year. A Minio is a little bit different than Pure Storage. It's software only, so you can run it on pretty much any x86 servers. 
and you can cluster them uh, with storage to serve up uh, an S3 bucket. It's a great solution for up to about 120 terabytes. Uh, beyond that, um, we're not sure about performance implications because we haven't tested it, but for your uh, dev environments um, or, or small production environments, we think it's great. Um, with Vertica 10, we are introducing Eon Mode on Google Cloud. This means not only running uh, Eon Mode in the cloud, but also being able to launch it from the marketplace. Uh, we're also offering Eon Mode on HDFS with version 10. If you have a Hadoop uh, environment and you want to breathe new, fresh life into it with the high performance of Vertica, you can uh, do that starting with version 10. Looking forward, we'll be moving Eon Mode to Microsoft Azure. Uh, we expect to have something breathing in the fall uh, and offering it to uh, select customers for beta testing, and then we expect to release it sometime in 2021. Following that, further on the horizon is Alibaba Cloud. Now, uh, to be clear, we will be putting Ali, uh, Vertica in enterprise mode on Alibaba Cloud in 2020, but Eon mode uh, is going to trail behind whether it lands in 2021 or not. We're not quite sure at this point. Our goal is to deliver Eon mode anywhere you want to run it, on-prem or in the cloud or both, because that is one of the great value propositions of Vertica is the, the uh, hybrid capability, the ability to run in both the your on-prem environment and in the cloud. What's next? I've got three uh, priority and roadmap slides. This is the first of the three. Uh, we're going to start with improvements uh, to, to the core of Vertica, starting with uh, query crunching, which allows you to run long-running queries faster by getting nodes to collaborate. You'll see that coming very soon. We'll be making improvements to large clusters, and specifically large cluster mode. Uh, the management of large clusters, uh, clusters over 60 nodes, can be tedious. We intend to improve that, um, in part by creating a third network channel to offload some of the communication that we're now loading onto our uh, spread or agreement protocol. Uh, we'll be improving depot efficiency. Um, we'll be uh, pushing down more controls to the sub-level, uh, subcluster level, allowing you to control your resource pools at the subcluster level, and we'll be pairing tuple moving with data loading. From an operational flexibility uh, perspective, we want to make it very easy to uh, shut down and revive primaries and secondaries on-prem and in the cloud. Right now, it's a little bit tedious. Uh, very doable. We want to make it as easy as a walk in the park. Uh, we also want to allow you to be able to revive into a different size subcluster, and last but not least, in fact, probably the most important, the ability to change shard count. This has been a sticking point uh, for a, a lot of people, and it puts a lot of pressure on the early decision of how, how many shards should my database be. Uh, uh, whether it's in uh, 2020 or 2021, we know it's important to you, so it's important to us. Ease of use is also important to us, and we're making big investments in the management sub uh, the, the um, uh, management console uh, to improve managing subclusters, as well as to help you manage uh, your load balancer groups. Um, we also intend to grow and extend Eon Mode to new environments. Now we'll take questions and answers.